Norman Dewis, Jaguar test driver, welcome to Race Retro 2016. Yes, it's nice to be here. Another year come, and uh, every year we're here, so uh, it's another round on the records of uh, the cars. That's it. So, so can you give me, how did you get started? To, how did you become a test driver with Jaguar? Well, I was already uh, testing for Lee Francis. I was doing the same job there, chief test engineer. And uh, I had a phone call from uh, Bill Haynes. He was the director of engineering at Jaguar. And he said, Mr. Dewis, we've read a lot about you. You, you. you built your own race car racing. You do an excellent job at Lee Francis. Would you like to come and uh, have an interview for the same job at Jaguar? We, have a, we haven't got a test engineer. Because the guy who was doing it, he'd left in April uh, of, of 1951, you see. I said, well, I'm quite happy at Lee Francis. And uh, I said, but I'll, I'll come along and uh, have a chat, you know, just out of formality. Yeah, yeah. So I went along and met Bill Haynes. I'd never met him before. And uh, he said the job was a monthly staff job and uh, I'd been in charge of the development testing. Uh, going into the racing as well. So uh, that was it. Yeah. We had the interview, and I'd, at the end of it, I said, well, look, I'm not really interested. I'm, and I was, I was quite happy with Lee yeah, Francis. Yeah, yeah. He said, well, what would encourage you or persuade you to join us? I said, well, your salary is hardly any different to Lee Francis. But if you pay me £2 a month more... I'll come. Right, yeah. so what, year, what year was this? It was 1952. Uh, sorry, 51 when I had the interview. Yeah. So he, he hesitated a bit and he said, we'll pay it. <laughs> I mean, £2 a month. It was a lot then. It was a lot then. So I come out with a decent salary, but the one thing he did say after I uh, agreed to take the job, he said, oh, Mr. Dewey, he said, one thing I would say, he said, uh, don't tell anybody what we're paying you. <laughs> And uh, I don't think anybody ever knew what, what I got paid at Jaguar Cars for all the years I was there, you know. So which was the first model you tested? <clears throat> well, the first one, uh, my first job of development uh, was the disc brake. They had uh, they'd been dealing with Dunlops, discussing it with Dunlops. Dunlops said, yes, we could probably do it, because they'd already done it on aircraft. Uh, so they, when I joined, they'd already done lots. They'd already would, uh, they'd assembled a set of disc brakes on an XK120. Some guy out the drawing office had been driving it and said, "Oh, it worked well, you know." So uh, Hayne said, uh, "Could you get that be your first project? See what you think." Uh, as far as we're concerned, it's almost finished. So I took it to Myra and. Uh, completely failed a whole lot I mean it, I got the fluid boiling there was no break and uh, so when I came back I said you, you can't you can't boss this off at all <laughs> so he said well I said no it, it's no good the fluid boils knocked back on the pads long pedal and so he said no so what do we do I said well my first thought would be why put it on the XK120 put it on the C-Type the fastest car you've got the race car and if we can get it right on that, I said, then we should be all right for any future model. So that's what we did. We transferred it onto the C-Type. And uh, I met up with uh, Harold Hodkinson. He was the uh, development engineer for Dunlops. Him and his two fitters and myself, we started really doing the disc brake. And uh, we didn't want to go to Milo because all the press people use it. All the other manufacturers, Ford, Austin Morris and uh, Damon, all them. So we got in touch with the air ministry and uh, we asked them what disused aerodromes were around the Midlands. And they said, oh, there's one at Purton. That was near Wolverhampton. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, know, I know. If you'd like to hire that, you can. I mean, it's disused. So they gave us the keys. And we went over there, Harold Atkinson and myself, opened the gate, went in, and there we was. Grass growing a bit here and there, and we've got a long main runway and a nice perimeter track, and I said, Harold, we could make a circuit. Yeah. He said, do you think so? I said, yeah, we could do all the testing here. So we went up the road, saw the local farmer, 
ask him to drop uh, 250 bales of straw hay down at the circuit. And so we went back next day, we paid him, and we made with the straw bales we made up the circuit. So now we've got a place to test, and that's where it was all done at Purton, you know. Of course, the, the circuits then were built as a lot of circuits like that, weren't oh. Silverstone was like Silverstone that. Silverstone was an aerodrome, yeah. Gamston was an aerodrome, yeah. all these were disused aerodromes. So, as I say, the ideal thing was that we got it to ourselves, we could go in, uh, when we come out, lock it up. Nobody, there was no housing around there or anything, so nobody saw what was going no, on, you know. No, no. No, you wouldn't have to worry about noise or anything? No, no, nothing. So in the end, I say we had the long runway. I could get up to about 140 mile an hour down the runway. And then I had a big hard brake stop at the end. And of course, time and again, the pedal would go to the board. And you, you know, pumping in, mate, you've got no brake. So I used to run off the end into the grass, uh, drop it down through the gears, turn around and get back on the circuit. And I always remember... Uh, once we were doing the temperatures and uh, Frosty, he was one of the Dunlop mechanics uh, I came in, no pedal and smoke coming off the brake and Frosty jacked it up took the wheel off and he got a cigarette out and he lit off the disc and I, I said Frosty, he said, well that's the most bloody expensive cigarette lighter I've seen <laughs> you know, that's the sort of thing yeah, yeah. that went on those days and that's where most of it was done. Yeah. And it got to the point where we'd been working fairly hard at it. And I also remember I got back one evening back to the Jaguar, uh, into the experimental shop where my office was. So, and uh, Sir William Lawrence came over and he said, do it. So I said, yeah. He said, how much longer are you going to be working on this break with Dunlop? I said... Well, we're getting there slowly, you know. I said, we're, we're achieving it. I said, we've still got one or two problems. He said, well, I think you're taking far too long. <laughs> he said, in th if you haven't done it in three weeks, we pull out, Jagger pull yeah, out. Really? Hmm. So I saw Harold Atkinson next morning. I said, Harold, he said, well, I said, the old man, give us an ultimatum. He said, well, I said, three weeks if we are, we're pulling out. He said, you can't. I said, well. Yeah. So we were <clears throat> flat out for that three weeks, seven o'clock in the morning till it was dark at night seven days a week and we got it about 90 percent there so we could say yes yeah. we can drive on it there's still one or two little problems but it's not too bad so then we've got to that stage then we look and say right we've done all the set testing what do we do with it so we look at the calendar we said well one of the hardest races on brakes is the Milli Miglia, thousand mile race in Italy. Yeah. I mean, you've got all the towns and the cities, uh, you're driving flat out, up in the Raticosa and the foot of pass, all the mountains. <coughs> so we decided to enter, enter that same car with the discs on the C-Type, chassis 001, and um, get Sterling. I knew Sterling quite well. Yeah. Sterling said he'd drive, providing I went with him as co-driver. So that was it. We drove it. I drove it all the way down from Coventry to Italy over the Alps. We didn't have the Mont Blanc tunnel then. <laughs> that, must, that, must, yeah, that must have been quite a drive. Oh, never touched the brakes. <laughs> Geared it all over the yeah, top. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So uh, that's that's basically my first project. Uh, and again, at the end of it, we we were successful. You know, we came out very successful with the display. So after that, what, what was the next car you were uh, involved in, with? Uh, C-Type, of course, we raced uh, 52. That wasn't a, no, a good, good. That wasn't a good year for Le Mans for Jaguar. Uh, <coughs> 53 was better. 54, we came up pretty good. Uh, we had uh, disc brakes all around and for the Le Mans, and uh, so that cut down the number of pit stops. That made a big difference to your position in the race as yeah, well, yeah. especially with a 24-hour race. And uh, then following that, uh, uh, we went on to the D-Type. That was a complete new uh, revelation of, of a car from the old type of chassis. So was the D-Type heavier, a heavier car than the C-Type? No, no, no. It, uh, it worked out slightly lighter. We, we had about a total uh, dry weight was 1,900 weight, three quarters for the uh, D-Type. The 
seat out just went over 20 hundredweight, so there was it was a bit lighter. Because the construction was different for the D, you see. It was a new breakaway from getting away from a complete chassis. You had the tub, uh, the centre tub, then bolted to the um, to the tub uh, bulkhead was a subframe that carried the engine and the suspension. Right, okay. So you could detach that completely f from the uh, tub. Yeah. Then another subframe for the back. Yeah, that yeah. was a new breakaway f for uh, building a race car. Well, for any car. Yeah. I think it was two years later Formula One adopted the same principle. Really? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're ahead of them even? You're ahead of them even? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so you raced at Le Mans, uh, what year was? 55. I, I, I always raced at Le Mans, uh, but I was always a reserve driver, you know. So I always had to go and do my qualifying laps. Yeah. And uh, I always remember, I think it was uh, 54. That's when we had the short nose D type. Yeah. Uh, I went out and did my practice, and I was as quick as any of the, t the drivers in the team, which is going to be because I know the car better than them, yeah. you see. I'm living in the car yeah. day in and day out. And also, I think it was Tommy Wisdom. He used to be a uh, race correspondent for uh, Sporting, uh, Sporting World. And he, I always remember him saying to uh, Sir William, he said, look, Look at the practice. Dewis is as quick as any of your team. Why don't you put him in the team? He's dead reliable. He won't blow it up. And Lyons said, yes, he said, I know he's, he's, he's better than any of them. He's, he's a good top driver. He said, but what happens? He said, if there's an accident and Dewis, not, through no fault of his, is laid up in hospital, what happens at Jaguar? And uh, looking yeah, at it, yeah, he was yeah. quite sensible looking at it that yeah, way. Yeah. So you meant a lot to them, obviously, and, and, and oh, if yeah. you weren't there, what happens to the test programme? That's what he was saying, yeah, yeah. 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 You see, I wasn't only responsible for the race cars, I was responsible for the production, new, new production cars. I had a dual-purpose job. Yeah. You see, most Mercedes, Ferrari and them, they had uh, a test engineer, test driver for the racing, and another one for the uh, pr uh, production stuff, you know. Because I said to Lawrence once I, I got up to here, I could not. There was a race car I got to do. There was this new uh, new saloon car. Yeah. I think it was the Mark One saloon, yeah. Yeah. developing and trying to develop. And I said to him, I need. We need another somebody else. I said I can't. And he said, Why? I said, It's getting a lot. He said, Do it. You can do it. He said, We don't need another one. He said, You're the only one. And so I, I carry it, and I've all, I did it all on my own all the time. I see, I see his point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, all the cars, you knew them better than anybody, didn't well, you? Well, that, that's, that, that's what he was saying, yeah. you see. And, uh, but I always, I always, I mean, he was a very, very forthright man, a very hard man, but he did appreciate, he knew what, who was doing what and who, he, who his best men were. And I think in, in his eyes, I was... A, probably one of his, the best blokes he'd got, you know. And you also had a, a record for the fastest road saloon, was oh, it? Yeah, that was the uh, Belgium uh, record when I went over there. We took a 120. We'd been over there before, and we'd put the record... <coughs> we went over there in uh, April 53. We put the record, I think it was up to about 146 for the flying mile. Uh, and of course the reason we, we used to do that I mean we, not only us other, other companies went and did uh, runs as well record runs it was cheap publicity it didn't cost you much to do it I think they only charged 25 quid to close the whole road for the day and everything yeah. you know and uh, so we went over in April and I took the record I think it was up to 145 I came back got a lot of publicity on it and then I think it was uh, the end of August, first week of September, Lyons come to me in the shop. He said, Dewis, uh, your records uh, that you got at Belgium? I said, no, Jaguar. No, your, your record, he said. We got it for Jaguar, of course. <laughs> he said, you, you know you've lost it? I said, no. I said, well, I, I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't, I mean. Anyway, he pulled a newspaper out and he said, here, I look. 
he said this uh, Spanish firm uh, and he was trying to say the name I said oh you mean Pegaso that's it he said I took it off you I said when he said look here last week I said well, what they put it up to he said 155 he said you want to think I said look the, X, the XA120 is the only sports car we got. And the last time I drove it at 140, 45, I said the car was very dodgy. I said, I, I wouldn't want to drive it any. I said, I don't think we can get it any quicker. He said, well, I think you ought to think about it. He said, do something. So Haynes, my boss, next morning came. He said, has the old man had a word with you? I said, yeah, he was on about Jabeg. He said, he's been on to me. He said, I said, well, there's nothing we can do, really. He said, well, we ought to try something. So anyway, we got the XK120 in the shop. Malcolm Sayer, he was the aerodynamist. Brilliant man. He did all the 120s, the C-type, D-type, XK13, all the sports car. Brilliant shapes. He stood there. Uh, Bob Knight on the suspension. He was the suspension man. Emerson from the engine shop. He, so we look at the 120 and I said, look, what do you do with it? I, I said, I'm not driving it unless we... So Sayer said, well, if we undershield it right from the front to the back, seal it all underneath, get a good airflow. He said, and then we'll close the uh, passenger cockpit with a met metal tonneau. He said, and then we have a Perspex bubble over you, yeah. seal you inside, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and that's how we went. Jack Emerson said, if we take the offside headlamp out and duct it to the carburetors, get ram air, that will be worth another... This is how Bob Knight said, well, we'll stiffen the suspension so there's hardly any movement uh, because we're altering the airflow. He said, we'll buff the tyres off, no tread, and uh, blow them up to 50 psi so you only have a small contact. <laughs> and this is how they went. Yeah. So anyway, uh, cut the story, so we get the bubble and uh, we again have a, a session in the shop so I'm sitting Haynes said get in the car Norman. so I'm sitting in the car this is the 120 again they lower the bubble and of course it's about four inches from the body it's on top of my head <laughs> so I climb out the car and I said well that's it Haynes said well hang on a minute so he said to one of the fitters he said take the seat out so I knew what was coming <laughs> So they take the seat out, he said, get in, Norman. I said, no, I said, I am not sitting on the bloody floor. He said, just get in. So I get in the car, sitting on the floor, and of course the steering wheel, <laughs> his seven-inch wheel is up here, you know. And, and uh, I said, there's no way I'm driving this. So they undo the column, drop the steering column on the brackets. The steering wheel now is on my legs. So uh, he said, well, where would you want? I said, well, about there. But I said, it's on my leg. He said, don't worry about that. So he measured that. He said, we'll get a 14-inch wheel. We'll make a 14-inch wheel. So that's what we did. We finished up lowering the column, 14-inch wheel. I had a 3-inch saw bow to sit on, pad, and they made a small thing for, for me back. The bubble now hinged on the bonnet. So when I was in, it closed over me and they screwed it together from outside. So there's no way I could get out. So that's how we took the car to Javik. And uh, just to give you a, a quicker so survey of the run, we, uh, we got there on the Saturday and Lofty, he was the team manager, he said, uh, Norman, he said, well, how about Monday morning? I said, yeah. He said, that'll give me time to get the police to close the road and uh, all the time and equipment up, so they have to do. So I said, well, let's do it about half past six Monday. Half past six Monday, everything was right. We turn up, you have to, you have to uh, put the f ordinary fuel in, which they bring shell. They seal it so you can't put any nitro in or anything. And that's how the car was set up. Away we go. And... Uh, I do my first, I'm doing my first run down. I, I do one or two runs, warm it up. And then when I said, right, I'm going to do, this is the official time one. Did you have to do two runs again there? You have to do uh, one down and one back, but it's got to be within five minutes to count. So it's all you have is a black and white, big black and white checkered board. I can see that tells me that's the start of the flying mile and the kilometer. 
So I'm, uh, you have too much, they close five miles of the road and all the people have come over and standing on the side of the grass. It was, I mean, you wouldn't do it today, the health and safety. But anyway, I start my first run and I'm coming down and uh, I look at the ref counter through the gears and I'm now in top gear, I'm pulling 5.5, five, 5.6, five, five, 5.7. Five, now Jack Emerson, the engine guy, said, Norman, 5.8, just, just, just limit. The checker, uh, checkered board is way ahead and I'm now pulling 5.8 in top. Now I think, do I lift off and abort? I thought, no, we'll carry on. It was running smooth. I mean, the oil pressure was right. Water temperature was 70, dead on. So I let it go. And by the time I reached that checkered board for the measured mile, I was pulling 6.3. I went through at 6.3, got through. Then you have two mile uh, run out to come back again. I get to the end of the two miles, slow down, and um, the Dunlop guy who looked after the tyres, he was there purely to check the, uh, the tread, to make sure there was no canvas, because we, we'd reduced it down to two mil, buffed it up. He looked, I couldn't speak to him because of the bubble, and he just went, OK, do the run back, and I pulled 6-3 again. <laughs> yeah. Now then, I think, wow, that's good, we've done it. I then come back to uh, where the uh, timing people are, the equipment, there's all the press people, and as I pull up, Lofty, the team manager, he stands there with his arms folded, and he said, uh, you all right, Norman? I said, yeah, I said, excellent. Because then that screwed the bubble up. So uh, he said, well, you're not very quick. I said, well, he said, you're not very quick. I said, I've got to be. I said, I'll pull 5-3. He said, there must be something wrong with the rev counter. He said, you're not as quick as you were when we were in April. I said, Lofty, I've got to be. He said, no. And he walked slowly across now. Nobody had smiled. Nobody had looked. He came over, gave me a big hug. He said, you buggy, you know what you've done? I said, no. He said, 172.4. He said, you've shattered, you've shattered the record. <laughs> And all the crowd cheered then, you know. Yeah. But they'd, they'd arrange this, don't, yeah. don't let him know when he pulls. Yeah, yeah. It was all the way you did things them yeah, days. Yeah. Very, very comical and a bit of fun, you know. So how, did lo- how long did that record last? Still got it. Really? Still got it because, <laughs> because what happened after that? Oh, just to finish off our side of it, <coughs> Lofty, when we got back to the hotel, said, I'd better link the old man, that's Lyons, tell him. So he, I heard him on the phone, yes, yes, he said, Norman's really shattered it, 172.4. And he's saying, no, 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 he said, uh, miles per hour. The old man had thought it was kilometres, and he said, that's not very quick. <laughs> so Lofty had corrected that. Then he put him on, he said, Norman, he wants a word with you. So I got off the phone. I said, good morning, sir. He said, uh, Dewis, congratulations. I told you you could do it. He said, I knew you'd get it back. He said, by the way, I've just so, said, told England to uh, go into Brussels tonight. You can have a bit of a party. I said, oh, thank you. He said, but don't forget, Dewey's champagne's very expensive. <laughs> Anything on the money side again. <laughs> and then, of course, you, um, you had an accident in a car that was used for a Bond film. Is that right? Oh, that was the XJ13. Uh, I'd already had a crash in a C-Tive in the D-Tive. But the XJ13 was a one-off, first rear engine car we'd built, first V12 engine to run, and uh, it was during the, uh, I was doing a film on, uh, for the film people, and uh, I'd done a, <coughs> they, we'd done all the still shots and all that low speed. Then they said, would I go on the outer circuit, that's the uh, triangle circuit, 2.8 mile, with the banking at each corner. I'd already got uh, the lap record there of 160 for a lap. So I said, well, what do you want? They said, well, can you do four quick laps? We're going to put a camera up on the bank in so you, we see you coming into it. I said, you know what I do. So I've done, uh, I've done three laps. I'm on the four. No, sorry, I've done two. I'm on the f- third. I come round this top bank in, go down the railway straight, pull in about 180 down there. I'll just slightly lift, change gear to go on the banking, get halfway around the banking, and the 
offside rear wheel collapses. Steers me into the fence, I bounce off the fence, jarred eight down, I go on the infield, do about three somersaults, nose yeah. and tail, and then battle roll, you know. Yeah. But what happened, as soon as I knew the car was now 45 degrees, I knew something had gone on the back. Nothing was happening with the steering, so I switch off. And they all seem to be going quicker when you switch off. when you switch off <laughs> than when you run it. <laughs> so I switch off. That you got to do that. I no seat belts, of course. I got down in the passenger well and let it go. You know. Eventually, it stopped. I mean, if you've seen the photographs of the car, it was crunched that way and that way, and it was a muddy field. All the mud was ploughed <laughs> over it. So I climb out, walk back onto the circuit out of the crash I'm standing there and then I see these two cars coming down towards me one's got the film crew people in and the other one's got my two blokes in the mechanics they come and they stop and they say you alright Norman? I said yeah not so bad and where's the car? I said in the bloody field <laughs> when they saw it they said what? I said where you been? because they come nonchalant they said, we didn't know you'd crashed. They said, it's all we heard was the engine stop. We said, oh, he's run out of petrol. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that car was put away, wasn't it? Uh, it, it was left uh, right through till 1971. It was laid under a sheet. Uh, Lofty England became chairman then. Sir William had retired. And Lofty, being the race man, and that, he, he said, Norman, 13... He said, we've got to do something, it can't just stay under a sheet. I said, well, I've looked at it closely. The engine, suspension is perfect. It's all it is, it's all body damage. So we got in touch with Abbey Panels. They are the ones who made the body. I, we said to them, have you still got the wooden books that uh, you made? The yeah, we've still got them. So we said, could you remake the panels again for the cars? So that's what they did. They made a new another body off the same box and recreated the, the XJ13. It's still the only one and it's still around. Uh, it's in the museum at Jaguar, of course. But that's a fantastic car, you know. My max speed on that, I got 100 and, uh, 206 out of it, mile an hour, yeah, yeah. I mean, those days, that was 1965. So, you know, we were way ahead of people in those days, yeah. So, if, if, you, if you could go back to doing anything again, would you, would you do everything the same? Yes, I would. Yeah. yeah, there's only one way to do it, and that is to try and do it right. Yeah, yeah. You're looking to try to get perfection. I mean, it's a big responsible job, because they build something. It's never been run. It may have a new engine, new gearbox, new axle, new system. You've now got to break, make something of that car either to sell to the public or, if it's the racing, to go and win races. You can't do enough testing, you know, it's always test, test, test. But uh, I say, I was always after perfection. You never get perfection, but with what you're given, you try to get the best you can, so the max, you know. And I think we, we did a pretty good job, really. I mean, nothing gave me more pleasure than uh, on a Sunday, uh, four o'clock Sunday at the end of Le Mans, on the pit counter stand there and see your cars win it after 24 hours you think we didn't do a bad job there you know have you ever been to the classic the, the more classic yes yes i'll probably go in again this year you know yeah yeah but i mean <coughs> from what what we were doing in the 50s uh, the circuits all all changed now i mean Mulsan, uh the, the long straight which is nearly three miles or was they've now put a chicane yeah. Now, in 55, when I was driving, I went down Mulsanne and I got 192, the fastest recorded. I had to to pass Kling in the Mercedes. That was a great day. <laughs> when you know you've, you've passed yeah, yeah. the Mercedes, yeah, yeah. and I got the fastest down there, 192, you know. But I say, uh, as regards the Jabek, what they did to celebrate uh, that uh, I'd done that speed, the police said, and the and the automobile club of Belgium said, no more, it's too dangerous. Because the car, the car was weaving, and these people, you know, if I'd have gone off, 
There's nothing I could have done. I couldn't have got out myself because I'm screwed in. <laughs> so uh, they, what they did, they put on the side of the road, they put a beautiful stonework and uh, embossed in the stoneworks this big uh, bronze plaque recording what I did on the side of the road, you know. That's great, yeah. And it lights up at night. So I've got, I've got my name in lights. <laughs> Well, you've had a great career, yeah. Norman. Mean, it's, been, it's been great talking to you. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you lots of stories. Yeah, and it's very nice of you to invite me, you know. Well, it's very nice of you to, to yeah. int- let me interview you. And thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Nice to have been with you, and uh, I hope people enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Norman. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant.